Okay, well, first of all, for the people uh, following online, you can uh, register in this web page through this QR code, and you should be able to make some questions if you have. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Adriana and Steve and Asia, for setting in all this up. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which uh, we gather tonight is the ancestral and seeded and traditional land of the Maskean people, and that I'm really thankful for both having been given the opportunity of living here and, of course, of being able of coming to you tonight to talk a bit about uh, physics. Tonight I'm going to talk about the theory of general relativity, and I would like to start by uh, stating that this is not part of my research. I wish it was, but this theory was developed uh, all, a bit more than a hundred years ago by Albert Einstein, and I would like to remark that even though it's always forgotten in the story books, his wife at that, at that time, Mileva Marik, played a really important role in the development of this theory, as it was clear through several letters that they interchanged, but at the end she has been forgotten, has many women in the history, and specifically in the history of physics, which is still a really uh, bad territory in that sense. Okay, before I begin, I would like to uh, introduce a bit myself. My name is Pedro Villalba, as all of you know. My pronouns are he, him, his. And I'm a first year uh, physics master student here at the University of British Columbia. I'm working in the experimental cosmology group under the supervision of Professor Gary Hinshaw. And I'm working on the construction of a radio telescope, which is called CGM, which stands for Canadian Galactic Emission Mapper. It's planned to be on a sky by, if everything goes as planned, finger crossed, the end of this year. And this radio telescope will help us search for uh, radiation, uh, radiation from the really early universe. This is a picture of me with my parents. It's the most recent one. <laughs> and where I'm from? Well, again, as all of you know, I'm from Spain. I'm from a small city in the south of Spain, which is called Granada, and which many of you might know, uh, since that's where Alhambra is. Alhambra is a really old uh, Nasari palace uh, situated in this Hill, and this is all the city and I live over there. And also I have included in the, through the presentation in some slides, I have included a small picture of Alhambra or of Granada. In case you don't like physics, physics you can enjoy at least the, <laughs> you can enjoy the, the pictures. Okay, uh, as I said at the beginning, I'm going to talk about the theory of general relativity, and this theory is a theory of gravity. Gravity is one of the four fundamental forces of nature. So the first thing that I'm going to start doing is to introduce what are these forces, how people have, throw, have thought of this through history. And then I'm going to go a bit more deep into, the, into gravitation, into the history of gravitation, and some of the problems that the Newtonian gravity, which is the ones that we are used to studying high school or in first year physics, why that why physicists, physicists started realizing that that theory was wrong. After this, I'm going to, in both three and four, I'm going to go deeper into general relativity. I'm going to see how Albert Einstein and, of course, Mileva Marik solved this problem, revol uh, basically revolving all the physics that we knew at the beginning of the 20th century. And I'm going to explore some of the consequences, such as black holes, gravitational waves, uh, gravitational time dilation. And I'm going to end that by stating that even though this is a really good theory that has shown really good results up to the moment, thankfully for me, because if not I, was not, I, would, I wouldn't be a graduate physics st uh, student, uh, this is not the end of the story and there is a really exciting, at least for me, road <laughs> to come. But first, um, and this is for my, from my mentor in my alma mater in the university, at the University of Granada. I would like to make it clear that I don't want this to be a one-hour lecture of me just mumbling about physics with my weird accent and just doing things, saying things. Please interrupt me if anything that I say, that I say is not clear, if everything I maybe didn't pronunciate something correctly. There are no stupid questions, but 
only stupid answers, so please do interrupt me. I wouldn't mind like not covering half of the presentation because of interaction. Okay. Okay. Through history, people have always has always tried to explain the world that's surrounding them in terms of simple things that they could explain and that they could touch or see or sense. The first historical reference that I have, even though it's not probably the first one, is about Empedocles, uh, who in, its, in a poem called On Nature, uh, dated from 450 years before uh, Christ, he, explain, he will explain everything that he will explain that everything that we see and everything that we can touch is made of four elements. These four elements will be the earth, earth, the, the air, the earth, water, and fire. And people will, uh, will add a fifth element, which was either people later on in the Antique Greece will talk about seven elements. And even though today we know that this is not correct, this concept of, the, of explaining everything in terms of fundamental interactions or fundamental concepts is, is still remains in, the, in physics. And today we say that we explain everything in terms of four fundamental interactions. The first interaction is the one that I'm going to talk about is gravity. And it's basically the one that takes into account the fact that I'm not levitating right now. It explains how people fall, how people, like why objects fall, why people fall. But, as Albert Einstein said, doesn't explain why people fall in love. And this is a real quote by him. Um, the second force is the electromagnetic force. And this is basically why we have light right now. It explains why electrons move the way they do in an atom, uh, like uh, doing circles. It explains why, the compa why compasses align towards the north uh, pole. Basically explains everything that has an electric charge. And there are two other interactions which uh, are, take place at a subatomic level, and these are the weak interaction and the strong interaction. We are not going to talk about them today, but just to get a sense of it, the weak interaction is responsible for some radioactive processes that undergo in the nuclear, in the nuclear atom, for example, for nuclear fission or nuclear fusion, it also responsible for the beta decay, and an, ex an application in medicine might be the PET uh, used in nuclear medicine to treat some kinds of cancer. And uh, the other interaction is the strong interaction, and this is basically responsible for keeping protons and neutrons the way that they are. Today we know that neutrons and protons are not irreducible particles in the sense that they are made, out, made up of quarks, and this strong interaction is the responsible for keeping all these quarks together. And about gravity, yes? Sorry? You? Okay, um, there are six quarks in nature, but protons and neutrons are only made of two ki different kinds of quarks. U stands for quark up, and D stands for quark down. Neutrons are made up of two quarks down and one quark up, and protons, two quarks up and one quark down. Sorry? Yes. Oh, this has, when come the, where comes the electric charge? If that's, I'll answer that in the, uh, towards the end, because that's a different story here. Um, okay, about gravity. Um, this is probably the force that people began thinking about in the first place. In the antique Greece, the first reference that I have comes from Heraclitus, who, even though didn't talk specifically about um, about gravity as we know each other, he will talk about a logos, which means word in, in English, and he will use this word to describe some kind of force that kept the harmony in space, that will explain why uh, planets and stars moved, and he will say that this will explain how waves uh, propagate, even, and even though we know today that gravity is not responsible for this, uh, this is the first kind of 
thought that we could that we could attach to gravity. Yes. So like, logos is means word. Yes. I have no idea, and that was one question that I had while preparing the presentation, and I had no idea. Yes, just okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for that because I asked myself the same thing, and I guess I was wondering that, oh, maybe it's just the evolution of language, but yeah. Um, after this, Aristotle will talk about an inner gravitas or inner heaviness, and this is where the word gravitation comes from, as you can expect. And he will make this claim, which might sound a bit innocent, but it remained unchallenged for almost 2,000 years, and it's not true. He will say that if I drop two objects of different weights, they, will, they wouldn't reach the ground at the, same, at the same time. Today we know that this is indeed the case, that no matter how heavy something is, it will reach the same the ground at the same sp at the same time than any other thing, and this played a key role in the development of gravitation, as we shall see in the next slide. To end, I would like to remark the figure of Archimedes, who didn't talk about gravity or about any force, but he was the first per the first person who introduced what we know today as the center of gravity of a triangle. But he did this in a pure mathematical way. People you've often claim that Greeks, the Greeks were really good physicists or really good philosophers. They were not, from my point of view, really good physicists, but they were really good mathematicians because they did this by pure geometry without uh, exp doing experiments on, on it. After this uh, conception that people had in the anti Greece, there was not a big change of paradigm in the way that people thought until the scientific revolution. And concretely, it was a Spanish priest uh, whose name was Domingo de Soto, and again, is one of the figures that is usually forgotten when talking about gravity. But he was the first person that talked about objects in free fall accelerating uniformly. Or what is the same? Two objects falling at the same at the same rate. Usually, people talk about Galileo Galilei as one of the first uh, person who did this, and people will say that uh, he dropped two weights from the Leaning Tower of Pisa and measured the time that it took for them to get to the ground. This is not historically accurate, and there are several. I can provide several references where in which it's stated that this is not. Accurate. It was other two Italian scientists who did this 40 years before, and it was done the first time. I think it was done in Delft, in Belgium, I believe. Um, but Galileo Galilei passed uh, through history as the person who was uh, kind of experimented with this. He did this with um, leaning planes, but he didn't do this with uh, in the leaning tower of Pisa. But in his works, he, even though they didn't coincide in space or time, Galileo Galilei made sure that he included the figure of Domingo de Soto as a key contribution to this new thought. Okay, after this uh, uh, pre-scientific revolution story, the, new, the gravity that, uh, many of, uh, that many of you might know from before was the um, uh, Newtonian gravity, which was uh, first published in the Principia Mathematica, uh, written by Newton, which is probably, I would say, the most important book in the history of physics. And I would even venture to say I'm one of the most important books if, in the history of humanity. And it's, oh, we all know the um, story of him lying down a tree and an apple falling into his head. Apparently, this story is true. There are several historians of that time who uh, claim that this, was, that this indeed happened. And this uh, force consists basically on uh, Newton will say that any two mass, any two bodies with mass, will exert a force on each other, which is proportional to the product of their masses, m1 and m2, but inversely proportional to their distances, which is basically r, r squared. This is right now, 
this bottle is exerting a force on myself and I'm exerting a force on this bottle and basically everything in this room is exerting forces on it, on everything. This theory and this, basically this uh, formula correctly applied predicts how objects fall and at the speed that they do so, predicts how planets move around the sun with a really high degree of accuracy, predicts, even predicts how galaxies move in a really large scale, and I hope that there is no any theoretical physicist listening to this, but Newtonian gravity actually works with this. And it passed one of the most important tests at that time, which was the prediction and adjustment to the data of, sol of, sol of sun and moon eclipses. At this time, when in the, towards the 17th century, whenever an astronomical theory was proposed, for example, Kepler's law or Newton's law, the basic test that it had to undergo was this, and it did, um, it did uh, succeed in its task with a really, really good degree of accuracy. Actually, I don't know if there is, well, there is one architect in the audience, but up to my understanding, this is the force whenever uh, there has to be any computation of structures or any, like you have basically to compute the force that any weight is exerting on any weight. This is the law and the force that is used, and I've been confirmed by other like engineers that this is indeed what it's used. So if this is the case, this force should be true. This Basically, everything is constructed in terms of this, explained in terms of this physics, in terms of this physics. But there are several limitations. Actually, I can think of five or six of them, but the two clearest, at least for me, and which illust better illustrate the problem that people encounter uh, when developing this theory were, first of all, um, theoretical problem, which is the one that I'm going to talk about right now, and an experimental fact. The theoretical problem is the following one. Is the following. If I had the solar system and all of a sudden I took the sun out of it, like I just took it, uh, how much time or how long will it take for us on Earth to realize that, this, that the sun is not there anymore? Okay, eight minutes, that's the time that the light, that the last light of ray, that the last ray of light will take to come to the Earth. And we will realize that by basically the light. But how will we know the gravitational interaction? Like that's because we wouldn't perceive any more light, but the Earth wouldn't be, if we imagine the sun here and the Earth rotating, if the Earth, if I take out the sun, the Earth, should or be in Newton's first law, should just follow a straight line. You say eight minutes, or it is it is correct as we shall see, but we'll see why. Yeah, sorry. You say to the. Okay, okay, that's one thing. Okay. Okay. You say that it's an instant force. This is correct for Newtonian gravity. The, well, the question that I just asked, oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, just another question, slightly unrelated. Um, okay, so if the sun is gone, there's still other planets that have gravity that are acting on one another. Yes. Ooh. Yes. Kind of yes. Well, that will happen. Yes, but my question was more on what would happen if I had just the sun and the Earth oh, orbiting. Yeah, yeah, no, but yes, that's that's that correct. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. That will actually. I, I mean, I could like one could do the computations to see what will happen, and my prediction. Please don't record this because I'm not sure. <laughs> My prediction, <laughs> yeah, I know. My prediction is that we would probably orbit around Jupiter. I don't know. I would like one should have to do the computations. Yes. Well, 
but yeah, but that will I don't it will depend what time of the year it will depend the exact the exact distances of the planets one will have to do again one will have to do the computations but it's a problem that can be solved and I don't know if I will know how to solve it but I should know how to solve it <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> um, okay, well, what I just asked is has a really important meaning hidden, and I just asked at what speed is gravity propagating. What uh, Merlin said is that this force is instantaneously. This was not the answer that Newton gave when Newton was asked this in the Royal Academy in London. He said, hypothesis non fingo which is, I assume no hypothesis, or in other words, I have no idea. If we took it to the last, if we took this Newtonian force to, the la, uh, to its latest consequence, the force would propagate um, instantaneously. But that has a problem, and that problem has to do with the theory of special relativity, which I haven't talked about uh, today. I will need like another whole talk uh, to talk about it, but it basically forbids any travel at a faster rate than the speed of light. If every travel at, the, at a faster rate than these 300,000 meters per second is forbidden, that means that no information can be propagated at a faster speed than this information. Therefore, we, couldn't, we, wouldn't, we would never be able to realize that the sun has been taken away instantaneously. And that's the first problem that uh, Newtonian gravity needs to solve, and this problem will be solved in the future. The other problem is an experimental uh, problem which was observed towards the end of the 19th century, and it's called the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. Let's imagine that we have just like this is the sun, and I have Mercury orbiting around it. If we imagine it has an isolated system, uh, this system should be uh, stable, and it should have a closed orbit around the sun. This is maybe an ellipsis, so it should have always the same perihelion, which is the closer point, the point closer in the orbit to the sun, and the same aphelion. But this was not the case. It is true that, as Liz pointed out before, there are other planets which, which also exert a gravitational force uh, on Mercury, and these planets will cause it will cause this orbit to not be exactly closed. And physicists at that time did this calculation, and they predicted a change in the perihelion. This is the perihelion would advance by 5,557 5, seconds of arc per century. But that was not what was being observed. There was a discrepancy in 43 seconds of arc uh, which people didn't know how to explain. People look for the existence of other planets, which, which they would call Vulcanus, which never appeared. And basically people didn't know what uh, to do with this problem. And, okay, the way to solve this problem is the following. Geometry. At least that's what Einstein did. Um, I'd like to draw the parallelism between the way that Einstein solved this problem and what was written in the Plato Academia in Athens, and it's basically let non bad geometers enter here. Now we have turned a pure physical problem into a mathematical problem, and we are going to talk about gravity no longer has a force at a distance, at a, at a Newton, but has the curvature of a space. But what is curvature? Apologies if there is any mathematician, because what I'm going to say is not the best uh, thing. But basically, we are used to see a flat space. Flat space is one in which this addition of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. But there are other geometries. We know that at least there are three types of geometries. Well, no, we know that there are three other geometries. Geometries that might have a positive curvature, such as this sphere, if one draws a triangle over a sphere, the, um, the addition of the angles will always be greater than 180 degrees. One can have hyperbolic uh, 
uh, geometries has this one, and one could have um, flat geometries. Okay, I said that this is a curve geometry, and we know that today we see everything has flat, but we know that the Earth is a sphere. How can this be possible? Even though this question might be seen as very like basic or some kind of a stupid question, this is the key of general relativity. General relativity is built in a mathematical structure called differentiable manifold. A differentiable manifold is basically a surface which might be curved, and it's usually curved, but at which each of those points, we can imagine it has flat. For example, this, uh, the earth, even though we know it's curved, at, it, at every of those points, we can picture it has flat. Right now, we think that this is flat, and if we look at Vancouver, we could see it has flat. Well, a person who is like, mm, crossing the ocean, since the ocean has flat, even though we know that it is not. And if we draw a, a triangle on the surface of the Earth, it wouldn't add up to 180, to 180 degrees. The deep meaning that this has, again, is that locally flat space-time, locally flat space, this is locally, like point by point flat things, are curved. And this is indeed what flat Earth support don't understand. In words of my, or again, of my mentor, flat health supporters should not learn more physics, but more mathematics, because this, up to now I haven't said anything about any force, any experiment, just um, mathematics. But one could ask, okay, I'm saying that gravity now is not something flat, it's not a force between two masses. What causes the curvature of a space? In words of John Wheeler, who was a Nobel, uh, a Nobel Prize, who that passed away, I think, 20 years ago, the theory of general relativity, which uh, could be summarized in 12 words. Mass tells space-time how to curve. This is if we imagine uh, something perfectly flat has the space and one put something on it, it will deform, it will curve um, uh, the space-time, and at the same time, if we accept as a principle that every particle obey, uh, follows the shortest path that it, should, that it could possibly follow, space-time tells mass how to move. At the same time that I have this uh, mass here, the particle that is coming with a velocity, with a speed here, which is maybe orbiting it, will follow this path, and this is the mass telling other masses how it should move. To put it into equations, and this is the last equation that I will show in the slides, um, what I have on the left, well, first of all, these are Einstein's equation, and this has basically everything that we should know and that we need to know about general relativity. Basically, the whole general relativity comes from applying this equation to, def to different situations or expanding it, or applying different techniques. If we look on the right, on the left, these terms, which are called tensors, this is called the Ricci, the Ricci tensor, this is called the metric tensor. This basically is the, curve, the geometrical content of a space, and on the right, I have the energetic contents of a space encoded in something called uh, a stress energy tensor, which is um, this T. Just an aside, as a mathematical detail, this is a set of 10, or, of 10 second order coupled partial differential equations, which are invariant under diffeomorphisms, and that makes it impossible to solve it for a general case. And that's why we have to look for certain solutions which has a really high degree of symmetry. For example, spherical symmetry, we usually assume static uh, solutions, but that was an aside. What I want, one of the takeaways from here is that a space is no longer static, it's no longer something that is not interacting with us. Uh, in the Kantian point of view, that was indeed the case, and space was just a 3D thing. But this is not what is happening. I like to imagine it as a river. At the same time that a river is being driven by how the mountain is, is telling it it should go, the water itself is telling the mountain how it should erosionate, and therefore it's making its own path. And that's 
the exact same thing that is happening with the space that I showed um, that I showed before. Okay, what all this is really fun. We've done a lot of mathematics, but what what is the cool stuff? What are the consequences of all this theory? First of all, uh, the first natural consequence that I can think of is Okay, I said that a space now is curved. Particles follow the shortest path, the path that takes it the shortest to follow, to reach something. What happens with light? Light, we know that it's made of massless particles, which are called photons. What is happening with this? If we are here and we try to, uh, to measure some energy coming from a point really far away from us, from a distant galaxy, for example, or from a pulsar or whatever, and we have a really heavy body uh, between us and the, um, and the galaxy, that will cause the space, to be, the space to be curved. And that will mean that we will be perceiving light, thinking that it's coming from a point when it's really not coming. This is called gravitational lensing, and this has been observed I can't recall if this is M87, but this is a picture of how a gravitational lens is formed over here, because probably there is something like really heavy here, which is bending space-time. This is a better diagram. Again, if we have like this heavy object here, and the Earth is here, we will think that light is coming from this point, but it's really it's not. It's coming from uh, from behind, and that will cause, again, like this kind of picture. The next consequence is probably the most famous one. The first person who attributed it was John Wheeler, the Nobel Prize that I talked about before. And it's basically, um, when I put too much weight on this space, what will happen? One could imagine the sun, which we know is not a really heavy star, has carving space, uh, space a bit. And that curvature is the one that uh, basically tells the planets how they should move. If one put a white dwarf, which is a more dense star, the curvature of a space would be even bigger. If one put a neutron star, even bigger. But what would happen? Is there any critical radius where if I put too much mass on it, basically a space breakdowns? That's a black hole. If I put here that much of a, um, of a compact uh, body, what is happening is the formation of something called a singularity, which is a, the mathematical way of saying we don't know where things are going. And this singularity is um, protected, not protected, but it's surrounded by a surface called event horizon. Any, uh, basically, everything that crosses this event horizon will never be able to live, not even light. And that's why it's called black hole, because not even light can escape, can escape from it. That doesn't mean, for example, let's imagine that I'm falling here. If I'm, if I'm at this point, that doesn't mean that someone here could not perceive what is happening here. What this means is that someone here could not emit a light ray that would leave this event horizon. Don't ask me what is inside of a black hole, because I will say that that's not physics, since there is no way that we could test where that is too. Sorry? Uh, what would happen to time in your uh, Give me two slides, <laughs> and, I will, and I will go into it. Yes? Let me come at the end of the talk because I have a slide for that at the end of the of the thing. Yes. Okay. So before getting into 
Okay. This. No, no, no. This. Imagine. Ooh. Okay. Imagine that this is a space. Imagine that this is vacuum, that I have nothing here in this, in the blazer. If I put a mass on it, this curves it, and any particle coming through here will just be following a straight line. Therefore, it will like change its trajectory. I don't know if that was your answer. I can give a mathematical answer, which is um, space-time is a differentiable manifold in which we do mathematics. Basically, space-time is is where physics takes place. It's the um, the playground of physics. Oh, I have many questions. Uh, yes. 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 So, okay, that makes sense to me as like a, as a theoretical concept of how much space. So yes. Yes. And it's still confused how that works if I thought space was a vacuum, so I'm just confused about how to get from like vacuum and void to that. Okay. This. But that's well. We are taking four dimensions and collapsing it to three. Okay, this is like uh, has a mathematical abstraction. Space-time is the model that we use to describe um, how things happen. So space-time will be. I don't, yeah, space-time would be basically the mathematical abstraction that physicists use to describe, for example, particular phenomena. Imagine you are in a space really, really far away from the influence of any body around you. If you took the mathematical description of that, that would be space-time. Okay, there were more questions. Please. Well, that's, I wouldn't say that that's a space-time. That's the way that we represent the space-time. A space-time itself, at the end, uh, words vanish and what stays is mathematics. At the end, a space-time is a mathematical object that we use to describe something. It's not that, it's a model. It's not has a space-time exist and has, if it really is something that is like carving or anything, it's, a mathematical model that we use to describe things. But that's what he, uh, he was saying is like the way that we represent, uh, that we represent the uh, space. Okay, well, as I said before, um, black holes are astronomical objects from which not even the light can live. This is a simulation of what will happen around a black hole. This is, this is, this doesn't mean that the black hole is this big. Actually, this is a galaxy and black holes are, well, this is not the whole black hole. I'm not going to say that black holes are not this big. But what, and here we can see how the light is being lensed as before, the gravitational lensing. And here on the right, uh, I'm showing the only picture that we have nowadays of our black hole. And this is a real picture, which was taken, I believe, three years ago by the Event Telescope Horizon. 
And this is the most, like, I would say, accurate confirmation that we have today that black holes exist. Even though we know that they exist because of other influence they exert on other gravitational objects. Coming back to the question that I did before regarding the, um, what would happen if the sun was taken out of the, um, of the solar system, the way that uh, Einstein's equation solved this is that if we took Einstein's equation and did something which is called um, perturbation theory, one would arrive at the conclusion that gravity propagates as if it was a wave, actually. Gravity propagates in terms of gravitational waves. Right now, as I'm moving, there are gravitational waves coming out of me that are informing all of you where, an, where I am in a space, and that is informing this, um, this bottle where am I in a space and what gravitational, not force, but what gravitational curvature I'm causing. But this signal is really, 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 really small. As a matter of fact, only a few gravitational waves have been detected up to date. I would say no more than 100. And all the time that we have detected this kind of gravitational waves has been caused by the most energetic events that happen in the universe. The first detection was, wow, well, seven years ago already in 2016 by the team formed by LIGO and Virgo. LIGO and Virgo are two interferometers Virgo, I don't remember where it is located, but I know that LIGO is uh, in the United States. And basically, this is um, an apparatus that measures really a small distance, really a small changes, variation in the length of an object. And as a gravitational wave is coming through us, this is causing a space, basically, like the space time that we had before, is causing it to make to do this to stretch and to um, go up and down. <laughs> to put in some numbers, the accuracy that this interferometer should have is of 10 to the minus 18 meters. And the radius of a proton, not of an atom, of a proton, is 10 to the minus 15 meters. So one should take, this apparatus should be able to measure 1,000 parts of a proton. This apparatus is, even though it is located in the United States, it's uh, capable of detecting any earthquake that takes place into, in the, uh, on Earth superior to three degrees in Richter scale. And basically the most challenging part that it has is to take into account the cars that go by in a highway that is like 50, 60 kilometers away from it. And that's really, really hard for the interferometer to, way, to do. Actually, at UBC, there is the Dr. Jess McKeever is working on this and is part of this collaboration. He's in the, my department. And another effect, which I think relates to what would, a question which was asked, that what will happen with time? Through this talk, I've always been saying space, 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 and sometimes I have said space time. Time is another dimension in the same way that space it is. So we can, like, what we could think about is that, okay, if space is carving, that means that time is changing. From special relativity, uh, we know that time is something that is relative to each of us, which is not something absolute, it's not an absolute uh, reference frame. So if one took these consequences to its last, if, two, if, the, if one took this fact to its last consequence, one would have something has, I don't know if many of you have watched Interstellar, what happened in the movie. Um, uh, apart from the dimension of love, this movie is really accurate in what it comes to, to science. Um, I, don't know, I, don't remember, I don't know if you remember when there was this satellite orbiting this really heavy planet and they were saying one, uh, 10 minutes on that planet is the same than seven years on Earth. That happens, and that's something that has been measured. And actually, the GPS that we have in our phones needs to take into account this relativistic correction. Yes? I was curious about the one scene in Interstellar where they have like, those multiple different timelines going on at the end of the movie. Is that accurate? Yes. I will have to watch it again. 
I will have to watch it again. The thing is, that because I don't, re I don't recall, but the thing is, and this is more of a special relativity thing than a general relativity, but special relativity tell us that, for example, if I think that to, um, if you, sh let's say, right now, you shoot something and I shoot something at the same, for you and me at the same time, special relativity tell us that if someone is moving really fast, that person wouldn't see you and I shooting it at the same time, or would it the same? The, there is something which is called relativity in the simultaneity of events. Two events that are seen as simultaneous for you and I, that are standing right now, are not seen as simultaneous for someone who is moving. I will have to watch the scene again, but probably it's, it has its physical background. Again, the, if it has, there is something which is called causality, which is basically if I break an egg, like you cannot see me has first uh, cooking an omelette and then cracking an egg. That has always to be respected. The cause, the effect has to come always after the, sorry, the effect has to come always after the cause. But if that's respected at a specific speed, uh, that may be, that may be accurate. Okay, we are almost done. Is there any question up to now? No, okay. As I said, this theory works perfectly. It has adjust many of the data that we have. It explains basically all the gravity, right, almost all the gravitational phenomena that we have nowadays. As Riku in his talk about this, and he might give another perspective. So what? We have a problem, and this is the I would say the most important open problem in physics. And it's the fact that quantum mechanics doesn't like general relativity. And general relativity doesn't like quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is the theory that governs everything that is small. The standard model of elementary particles, which we know describes really accurately both electromagnetic, uh, weak, and strong interactions, uh, describes forces, has the interchange of massless particles, which are called bosons, which are these uh, particles, which are the gluon photons, which is basically the boson in charge of the electromagnetic forces. But it doesn't say anything about gravity. Well, it does say, what it does say about gravity is that gravity is caused by a particle, which is called, which will be, by an hypothetical particle, which will be, which is called the graviton. But this particle has never been observed and in case it was observed, it will destroy, I don't want to say it too loud, it will destroy general relativity. Why? Because if we say that general relativity is the curvature of a space, to put that into words, we have not used any particle that needs to be interchanged or anything. Right now, with the physics that we have nowadays, um, we can explain, we can unify the weak interaction, the strong interaction, and the electromagnetic interaction. We can talk about things that move fast with special relativity. We can talk about things that are really small with quantum mechanics, but we cannot put all this together. There have been several solutions proposed to solve this problem, and if anyone has an idea, please go publish it, and you will get a Nobel Prize, and you will be famous. I wish I was that person. And this will be the famous that everyone is looking for theory, theory of everything. So there is a really exciting path to go. There have been several solutions proposed to this. Up to the moment, none of them have worked. I don't know if you know about string theory, which is probably really popular. Some people will say that, I don't record this, it's not, that's not science, because there is, that's not based on any experimental fact, even though the mathematical grounds that it has is really, really deep, and it's the, it's been said to be the most suitable candidate for a theory of everything, but there is many things to be done and many things to be explained. And okay, well, to finish, <laughs> the first conclusion, I hope, is that physics is cool. The second conclusion is really cool. Um, the third conclusion, and it's, this one is like, probably the most important one is that Newtonian gravity fails when it encounters special relativity. 
we have a change in the paradigm and now gravity is not a force but it's curvature of something that we call a space. It's basically geometry. In words of John Wheeler, and, maybe, and basically this will summarize the whole talk and will summarize anyone talking about general relativity, space-time tells matter how to move and matter tells space-time how to curve. There are several uh, evidences and examples of this manifestation in nature. Black holes, gravitational waves, gravitational time dilation, there are other effects that I haven't had time to go through. And of course, and this is the most important to me, this is not the end, and there is an exciting ride to come and that will hopefully be discovered by me. Who knows? <laughs> and yeah, this is a last picture of Alhambra. Thank you very much. Yes. Oh, uh, I would just like to, uh, I know we've been just firing questions, mm -hmm. but at least for the official question thing, um, maybe we can use the microphone for the people online. So yeah, thank you, Pedro. Thank you. Uh, thanks for a lovely talk. Thank um, you. It's a lot of fun having seen a lot of Nova specials on this uh, as a kid. Um, uh, I saw a phrase that I hadn't seen before um, that was related to a question I've been planning to ask since the beginning. Um, the phrase is on the like second to last slide: non-relativistic quantum gravity. What Ooh. the hell is that? Number one. <laughs> Number two. Like I mean. Part, part of that, um, I'm, I'm curious, I, I'm interested if you could talk a little bit more about these, these uh, w w weird, spooky, uh, theoretical particles nobody knows if they actually exist called gravitons. Oh. Because, so, you, you know, so this is something that obviously, like, if, if you're a chemist or another kind of scientist, you know, you've encountered the idea that people think of light as something that's a wave, and it's also, yes. it's, it's useful to talk about it as a wave in some cases, and it's useful to talk about it as a particle in other cases. And I'm curious, how is gravity different from that? Okay. Because you can measure, you, you can observe quanti quantization happening with light, and you can also observe wave behavior happening with light. So is gravity, is our understanding of it qualitatively different from that, that you can't observe quantization, but you can observe okay. wave behavior? What's okay. going on there? I'll answer to the first one, and I might ask, uh, ask you to repeat the second one. Sure. Non-relativistic quantum gravity, I'm not 100% sure, but I will say that non-relativist, for me, non-relativistic quantum gravity is gra do, doing gravity with uh, gravitons. Yeah. It's basically saying that gravity, accepting that gravitons exist and doing physics with that. That's what I will call as non-relativistic quantum gravity. Then, what was the first question that you said after this? So the, 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 que the question I have is so, People all over natural sciences have encountered the idea, most, almost all of them have encountered the idea that it's useful to talk about light as a particle or to think about it as a particle in some cases, and it's useful to think about it as a wave in others. Okay. And you can observe things that allow you to think in both worlds. You can observe that, um, that light seems to obey step patterns in some cases, and it seems to be continuous and, and, and have wave-like properties in others. Okay. So is gravity qualitatively different from that based on what we've observed, that you can only observe one or the other? Okay. Um, light is not either a particle or a wave. And, oh, well, first of all, full disclaimer from here. If there is this, like, actually this, I'm serious here, some of the things that, I might, that I'm going to say now might be wrong. But at least that's the understanding that I, that I have now, and I, because that's more of a quantum field theory question which I might not know how to answer. But what I will say, light is not either a light or a, is not either a wave of, or a particle. Photons are a mathematical object that we use to explain how things interact with each other. To the properly describe photons, we will need to do quantum mechanics and we will need to describe it in terms of a wave function. If one took the quantum mechanics part, one would observe some phenomena that are classically attributed to a particle, as for example, the fact that photons have momentum. This is if I, like, if I have enough light, I can basically like push, um, like I could basically push this. If I had, uh, that's, that's better seen in the, um, from a satellite. If I had enough light 
push, uh, coming from the sun, like that would exert a force on the satellite, and at the same time, light is quantized in the fact that it is not, you know that light is not, like right now, this is not a continuum of light coming out of this laser. It's one photon, 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 but many of them going at the same speed. The thing with gravity is that if we accept that gravity is not is the curvature of a space, we don't need any gravitons or anything. We are, we are just saying that that's not a force as we have understood before. We are just saying that that's basically a mass is carving a space, but nothing is happening. The fact that it's moving at the speed of light, it's a problem that we have for calling C a speed of light. The speed of light, 300, 300,000 meters per second, is a number that appears everywhere in nature. It has nothing special to do with light. Mic microwaves travel at that, at that rate. Gamma rays travel at that rate. Gravitational waves travel at that rate. And that happens and this is the part that I wouldn't be like 100% sure, that happens because one thing that is imposed when we are uh, developing general relativity is the fact that the electromagnetic force uh, has to be taken there into account. Uh, basically, electromagnetic force is described in terms of four fundamental equations, which are Maxwell equations. If one tried to mess that with a theory of gravity, there is a factor of C which comes from the per electromagnetic, from the mu sub zero and epsilon sub zero. I don't remember the names. I don't know the permeability, the vacuum permeability and the conductivity of a space. And that's where the, that C comes from. But the problem is ours for calling C the speed of light. It's the speed of many things. It's the faster speed that any object can travel. Light has nothing special to do. Well, the only special thing to do is that our eye can detect it. But that's all it has to do. In that sense, if we accept general relativity has that, yes, it is complete, the paradigm is completely different. If we don't see it like that, the fact that these uh, bosons, these particles which are the responsible for interchanging, for responsible for these masses, as these are massless particles, they should travel at the faster rate than they could, which is the speed of light. In that sense, if we accepted this relativistic theory, sorry, this relativistic quantum theory of gravity, gravity will not be that different to, to uh, other forces. I don't know if that answered your question. Maybe it didn't. Okay. <laughs> you can, we can talk later if you want. I'm sorry if it didn't. Thank you, Pedro, for the amazing presentation. I didn't think I would ever listen to anything physics related after I almost got a B, but here I am listening to your presentation. Um, okay, so I, I care a lot about, well, I, okay, I think bosons are interesting. I think the gravitational stuff is interesting, but I'm really interested in a unique application of physics to aging. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll get you there. So um, is it true that, the res like, Gravity is what is ultimately responsible for our wrinkles because it is pressing down at us all times. Like, if I l listen, follow me here. If I went to if I went to the moon and lived there for twenty years this. in a less gravitational state, whatever phrase it, however you want, and then I came back to a green college reunion, and then Carmel and Lindsay, who have been here for twenty years, just <laughs> just aging normally. Would I, <laughs> sh sh yeah, would I show up with less wrinkles? Like, is there something to like gravitational, gravity's constant force on us that causes these things to emerge aging wise? Okay, uh, see, I think of this in a simpler way. If you lived in the, fe in the fifth floor of a building uh -huh. and I lived in the first floor of a building, uh -huh. you will be younger. 20 years later than I, for me, 20 years later will go by, will go by faster than for you. Wow, wait, so like, I, I would look younger <laughs> if I lived. The effect wouldn't be appreciable. But if I went to another planet? Then we will have a problem, and it's the fact that you are accelerating and deaccelerating for leaving the planet. The thing is, I really <laughs> wanted to do this. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, well, whatever. No, that's. Uh, 
Thank you so much. Let's say that this planet is uh, less heavier. Yeah. When you, when you are coming from here to here, yeah. you need to leave the influence of this gravitational field. Uh -huh. And this um, leaving the influence of this gravitational field will make that time went faster for you. Mm. So I will have to do the math and it will depend, I think it will depend on how much time you spend here and accelerating mm. and at what rates you will accelerate, but the effect will be really, really small, like really small. So I won't show up with less wrinkles? I don't think so. Damn it. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. Thank you so much. That's all. Okay. Well, thank you so much.